Hello, good morning. Oh, I hear myself too much. <laughs> well, my name is uh, Manuel Blanco. I am the uh, European Research Area Chair in Solar. I think that we need to. Okay. You hear me better? Okay. So I'm the European Research Area Chair in Solar Thermal Technologies for the Eastern Mediterranean. Very. This one? This one? Okay. Yeah, but, but this one, I think, is, is on? Like that? No. I think it's even in very low volume, but I have the feeling that it was on. Okay. I hope it's better, or I am getting the sound somewhere. Is it good? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I hear myself very easily. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I have a very long title. <laughs> for, is, uh, I, I arrived to the, uh, to the Cyprus Institute two, two years ago uh, under a project that is a European Research Area Chair, that is a project of the European Commission that has the purpose of bringing uh, uh, experts to different groups around, around Europe to enhance the, uh, the research capabilities of the group. My previous uh, assignment, when I, before I, uh, I joined the Cyprus Institute, I was in, in Australia. I was working for CSIRO, the largest uh, research organization in Australia. And I was uh, uh, the director of a project called ASTRI, Australian Solar Thermal Research Initiative, that was about uh, decreasing the, or increasing the cost competitiveness of concentrating solar thermal technologies uh, by technological means. Before that, I was in, uh, in other places, but the one thing that you should know is I also was the director for several, for more than six years of the Plataforma Solar de Almería, who is the largest research uh, facility uh, research in, in the world uh, with these technologies and is located in Spain. And I will, during my presentation, I will also explain what uh, was referred before, why in Spain we have so much uh, development of, this, uh, of these technologies. I am going to... Uh, overlap a little, or I, I hope not a lot, with the previous speaker. I'm going to start talking. Uh, my, my, the purpose of my talk is mainly talk about what should be the role of concentrating solar thermal uh, technologies in the energy of the future. Uh, uh, I hope that by now we all know that we need to transition from a, a fossil fuel-based uh, energy system to a renewable energy system in order to survive as a, as a species. And, and, and we need to do this uh, uh, transition very, very fast. And, uh, well, I will try to explain to you why I feel that uh, concentrated solar thermal energy should play an important role in this transition, at least in the countries where uh, it was explained before this uh, uh, technology can be deployed. One interesting thing and one different, differential aspect of solar, uh, concentrated solar thermal technologies is that uh, we transform first uh, solar energy the, the radiant energy of the sun into heat, and then we use the heat for, uh, we transform heat into useful energy. So we have a, this step that we transform always uh, solar energy into heat, and that is a, a key difference with the photovoltaic. Photovoltaic, you directly transform uh, energy into electricity. So by transforming uh, uh, solar energy into heat, we can use solar energy for anything that you can use, use heat for. You can use solar energy for low temperature heat and then uh, to, you know, to have a shower, to, to, to heat the, uh, the water that you need for your house. You also uh, can use heat for heat processing. And you can, at very high temperature, using the thermodynamics law, transform this heat that has, if you are able to deliver the heat at very high temperature, you are able to, uh, deliver the, uh, to, to transform the heat in a large fraction into, uh, into energy and therefore into, into electricity or mechanical energy. So this is one of the main characteristics of this uh, technology that is different from, from photovoltaic, that we can use heat. And the interesting thing with heat, and I will go a little later, is that once you have heat, transform solar energy into heat, you can mix with other heats from other sources. So you, have, you may have a lot of uh, hybridization and integration of these technologies with other sources of heat. The main technologies have been already explained, so I'm not going to go much on that. We, uh, the first, we have to concentrate the solar radiation 
in order to, in, to uh, increase the temperature of a, a working fluid. And this working fluid, the, this increase in temperature of the working fluid is the thermal energy that we are transforming the solar energy into, into heat. We can uh, concentrate the solar radiation in a line, and then we have parabolic trough and the Fresnel associated that is the linear Fresnel, or we can concentrate in a point, and then we have the linear, the, well, the, the Fresnel uh, equivalent that is the uh, central receiver technology. When the parabolic disk is too large, we have to cut the, the mirrors in pieces, and we have to, and they will, we call them heliostat, and then they, this heliostat will act more or less like, like, a, like a disk. Yeah. The same thing for the, for the linear uh, Fresnel, and well, I'm sure that they have been explained before. But as I said, uh, one of the interesting things of these technologies is you have always to concentrate the solar radiation. One of the reasons is to decrease, uh, to, uh, we need to always improve the, the efficiency. We're transforming solar radiation into heat. And uh, when you transform uh, solar radiation into heat, you are heating something at a temperature. And the larger the area of this something that you are heating, the larger the losses, because the, 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 the losses are proportional to the area. Also, typically, if you want to, uh, uh, the surface where you are concentrating the solar radiation, you are uh, absorbing the solar radiation, has a specific properties, so it's relatively expensive per square meter. So you try to decrease that surface, because it's, it's, it costs money, and you can also try to decrease the surface, because by decreasing the area where the transformation of solar radiation into heat takes place, you are decreasing the losses. That's why all these concentrating solar thermal technologies, they are called concentrating. They concentrate the solar radiation because you need that if you want to achieve high temperature. Why do you want to achieve high temperature? If you want to get exergy out of the heat, more exergy out of the heat, in, uh, if you want to produce uh, 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 electricity, or if you want to drive thermal processes that require this high temperature. If you don't require very high temperature, more than, let's say, for lower than 200 degrees, then there are other technologies, flat panels and other kind of panels that are, uh, let's say, easier to use and, and more uh, appropriate than, than this technology. But in any case, we concentrate the solar radiation, transform the, the concentrated solar radiation into the uh, enthalpy increase of a working fluid, and this, enthalpy, this working fluid can be exchanged, can exchange the thermal energy that it has or the increasing thermal energy with some other media or can be stored directly in the thermal storage and also can be used to feed a thermal process. And the thermal process, as I said before, can be heat that you need to deliver for an industrial application, electricity, heat that you need to drive a, a, a very high temperature solar chemistry application to transform the energy from the sun, to store the energy from the sun into the uh, chemical bonds of of uh, compounds that you will have solar fuels. You can use the energy also for thermal processes that are very targeted like uh, solar desalination. And this is a typical, well, it's a very good application because typically when you have a lot of sun, was explained before, you don't have a lot of forest or you don't have a lot of rain. And so typically solar uh, radiation and, and a scarcity of water are, are together. You can also use the ultraviolet uh, part of the solar radiation for detoxification, including in addition to the thermal energy. And other interesting application, uh, let's say heat process application are solar oil recovery. You, uh, people can produce steam and then use the steam to improve the, the yield of, of oil uh, wells, etc. So this is uh, the, and the, the other thing that is very interesting is that you can, once you transform the, uh, they move? <laughs> so I better don't move too much. <laughs> so the, when, uh, the other thing is that you can, uh, uh, once the solar radiation is transformed into heat, then you can combine with other sources of heat. In Spain, we have an interesting application in the north of Spain that is a, a plant that is a solar plant that is hybrid with a, a, a biomass plant. So this, uh, so we are combining together the. Um, We are combining together the heat from the, from the sun together with the biomass. So we have a plant that is uh, running in, 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 in renewable energy uh, uh, continuously, okay. with either with biomass or with, uh, or with, uh, or with uh, the sun. And so we, we have the hybridization, and they also uh, use a combination of thermal, of thermal storage. Typically, uh, the most uh, application that are now, more, more, most of the commercial application of this technology is to, pro to the production of electricity. 
when you want to produce electricity, as I said before, you go into the uh, loss of thermodynamics. You want to transform the solar radiation into, into heat at the highest possible temperature. There is, uh, and I'm not going to enter into this, I, I don't know if you will enter into the course at all, uh, there is an interesting relation between the limits of concentration, how much you can concentrate solar radiation, and the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. But uh, so that's, uh, and also if you look at the exergy of the solar radiation directly, how much of the energy that, is, uh, that you have in the, in the solar radiation can be transformed into, into work, this is also based on the loss of thermodynamics. And the, and the particular characteristic of the solar radiation, you can uh, more or less uh, came to the conclusion that more than 90% of the energy from the sun can be transformed into, into, into work, into exergy. But in order to do that, you have to uh, uh, transform, if you are going to transform the solar radiation into heat, you have to, to, uh, to, uh, to obtain this heat at very high uh, temperature. That means high concentration ratio because in order to increase the temperature you have to decrease the losses and to increase the, the concentration. So this is just a general overview. I'm sure that uh, uh, the former speaker has uh, gone into much more detail. And I'm going to talk to you about what I call, well, not only me, it's, uh, all the consultants in the, in the world, they call the value, the value proposition. It's what is the specific things of this technology that, that make them uh, particularly uh, valuable. One of the, the, um, the, the things is, and it's related to the, to the fundamentals of the technology. One important characteristic of this technology is that it can be used for a very, range, very large range of energy service options. And this is because we transform the energy from the sun first into heat, and then you can do a lot of things with this heat. So we, you can use uh, the energy for heating and cooling, a heat process at high temperature, electricity, solar fuels and other solar chemistry application, among many other things. The other thing that I said before that is a very interesting and is a particularly uh, appropriate for uh, a particularly characteristic of this technology is that it can be hybridized with other, uh, with other sources of, of heat. And then you can have, uh, as I said, biomass plants together with uh, solar running, uh, renewable energy plants running all the time. Because sometimes we are talking in the discussion about how to evolve the energy do the energy transition, people are saying, well, there is no sun at night. Okay, that's not sun at night, but we can store the energy, we can, uh, uh, let's say, oversize the, our system in the morning, so that we can store a lot of energy in the sun in the, in the, in the evenings, and also we can hybridize when it's, uh, there is biomass or other sources of, of heat available with other sources of heat. Uh, it, uh, it can be hybridized also with uh, fossil fuels, and this is also something that other people have uh, in the past put forward that perhaps a smooth transition will be to start with a hybrid plant that will make, uh, let's say, in the, current, in the current content, most economic sense. And then you increase the solar fraction as you are evolving the technology, reducing costs, etc. But the hybrid plants will allow you to deploy the technology at a reasonable cost and reduce the cost because by, le by the learning curve. Because the more you, you do something, the more you learn how to do it better and the more you can reduce the cost, in addition to reducing the cost by improving the, the technology. And the other in very important characteristic that people tend to forget is a, a typical uh, concentrating solar thermal power plant is just a conventional power plant in which we which have replaced the boiler or the, or the, the uh, with the, um, uh, instead of using fossil coal or, or, or fuel in the boiler, we are using solar radiation. So it's a conventional power plant. You have a conventional uh, turbine, etc. This is one of the reasons that uh, when we were developing this technology in Spain, we were uh, from the beginning, before developing the laws that makes it possible, the feeding tariff that make it possible the deployment in Spain, we were working for uh, a lot of years with the uh, electric utility and uh, especially with the system uh, integrator, the system uh, operator. And they like this very much because, uh, first, because of the capacity of hybridization. You, can, you, have a, you deploy a lot of these plants, you have turbines, conventional turbines, and then if you need it for whatever, you have a catastrophe, there is a volcano eruption, you are not, you still have the, the hardware and you can run the hardware with gas. Okay. So this is one of the very interesting things. The other thing is that these uh, plants, because they are a rotational machine, they are conventional, uh, more or less conventional turbines, they provide all the ancillary capacity, capabilities that you need typically in an in a electrical system. Okay. 
rotation capability, the, uh, the spinning up, and also the capability of the uh, cosine uh, function, etc. Et so this is a very interesting thing that other, uh, other technologies don't, don't offer. Other thing that is also uh, interesting is that is they are uh, technological advance, but they are at the level that can be uh, uh, many countries can contribute to the development of these technologies. One of the experience, uh, very in good experience that we have in Spain is that when we started to deploy uh, these technologies, and we have been working for in, in these technologies for almost 30 years before we put the forward the feeding tariff, the, the first plans. 60% of the content was national content, was content uh, produced by countries in, in Spain. At the last plant that we were de deploying in Spain, 80% of all the, uh, the value of the plant was uh, the, uh, generated in Spain. Okay. This is also, you have, I think this is also a very interesting point because it's not the same for the economic, at least let's say when you look at the economy, uh, from the point of view of different agents, the, each one sees something different. The, the guy who is just trying to deploy as a contract how to produce electricity is going, may go to for the lowest price, and he doesn't look at all the things. But if you are looking at the country level, it's not the same thing to, to, put a lot, to pay a lot of money that goes out of your country to buy fossil fuels than uh, to put a lot of money in things that are generated and create value in your country because it, it increases the economy, the, the economy of the country. You get a lot of uh, re uh, revenue that you're putting forward back through uh, taxes, through employment, etc., etc. I will show you later because people were saying that in Spain the feeding tariffs were too high and then when the Conservative Party arrived and was completely in favor of the electric utilities that entered into this late, then they stopped the, the process. But then the, the thing was, well, we are in the economic crisis, we cannot afford this. I will show that, that this, this was not the case, it was some political reason. When you consider at the country level all of the advantages, of the economic advantages of deploying this technology, the balance, at least in, in the case of Spain, was uh, positive and is still positive. So, the, well, and also we have, uh, I've been involved in, in, in studies for the World Bank, for India and other countries, and you have always the capability when you are deploying uh, these uh, technologies in a country to reorient part of your uh, industry to provide, pro provide services and, and goods for these plants because this is mainly metal, steel structures, uh, mirrors, and in many countries you produce mirrors, metal, etc. You have uh, either some capacity to produce uh, cars, etc., etc. Every time you have some industry for piping, etc., these industries can be, let's say, retargeted or they just make uh, mechanical structures to produce this. I was uh, also the director of a renewable energy department in the National Renewable Energy Center uh, of Spain, in the north of Spain. They have a lot of tradition with the uh, uh, automotive industry. Volkswagen is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, was, uh, is located there, a big plant from Volkswagen, but in the past also. And uh, they have a lot of companies, uh, an ecosystem of companies that uh, have a very uh, good specialized in, in metal structures. Some of these companies, they were able to move to produce the metal structure by stamping, etc., of the solar collectors. And now they are also producing, not only for the country, but uh, worldwide, they are uh, producing this kind of thing. So it's, a, it's a, this thing about that the expertise is available in many countries, I think is a, is a, is a good uh, uh, um, value of this, uh, of this technology. I was involved uh, at the beginning when uh, Morocco was uh, trying to decide what to do in Guasasate. I was involved in the discussion if only go photovoltaics, it goes concentrating solar thermal, and I make this point with uh, much more data, etc., about what will be the what is the important implication of deploying the, the technology in, in your country, and what can you do? Uh, well, the, the advantage of, of having some control on the on the technology, because uh, right now, to me, sometimes when you go for photovoltaics, you are importing the panels completely, and if you are not doing research, you are not developing something in your country. At the end, you are just putting <laughs> it's like oil, but uh, better. <laughs> But still, from the point of the economic thing, you have an, uh, most of the money goes out of your country, and the expertise is not in your country. Here, I think, is more balance in this kind of thing, and I think this is a, this is also a very good for the, a very good property of this technology. The other thing that I that I think is important because of all of this uh, characteristic is that if you have sun, you have direct solar radiation, this technology can be 
have all the attributes to be the backbone of a highly decarbonized energy system of the future. People are saying, well, uh, I was recently in a, in a, in a, in a meeting here in, in Cyprus about the, was a, a meeting sponsored by the uh, European Commission. And we're talking about the deployment of energy in islands, renewable energy in islands. There was a question from the public saying, can you do 100% renewable energy in islands? And some of the people that were there say, no, no, because we don't have cheap energy storage. The thing is, uh, for, and then I raised the hand, I said, well, this is not the case. The thing is, you are not considering, only considering as alternative a wind and photovoltaics and batteries. If you consider in addition to wind, photovoltaics and battery, you consider concentrating solar power, the whole thing changes because you have a, a spinning capacity, you have a low uh, cheap uh, thermal storage, Etc. Etc. And these plants can be can be working. Uh, we have in Spain a plant that has 13 hours storage, and from the beginning of uh, of, uh, of the spring until the end of September, they are running uh, 24 hours the time. And you can modulate how much storage you want depending on the capacity of the system. So you don't need a uh, well. The other thing that is always uh, said when I was also in the center in Spain in the north, we have a lot of deployment of uh, wind. In fact. Uh, the region of Navarra has, I think at the time, was uh, of the order of 90% of the energy by wind, was, that the energy that the region needs was uh, generated by wind. Of course, it was in, merged in the, the global energy system of Spain. But a lot of people, the criticism was every time I put a wind turbine, I have to put some backup because uh, I need it in the, in, in the past. Well, the, you don't need a backup system. This is a conventional power plant. You just need a pipe. If you don't trust the thing or you don't trust the storage, you want to buy a lot of storage, you just need the pipe to have a gas to also feed the, the turbine in addition to, the, to doing with, uh, with solar energy. The other thing, so the, also the, this, uh, this plant can play from base loads to picking plants, can provide a critical grid stability, and, and this has been proved uh, with many studies from NREL and others to increase the penetration of non dispatchable energy technologies. And as I said before also, this uh, can also decarbonize substantially the industrial and the transport sector because you can, uh, uh, at high temperature, you can uh, transform the solar energy into uh, solar forms. Okay. The thing is, some of these things that you can do are closer to the market than others, but all of these things have already been uh, proven. Okay. So this is the value proposition now. The global opportunities. I think that I'm going to go very fast because I, I think that this is uh, being addressed before. But yeah, of course, this is uh, the, this uh, technology can deploy where you have the, the resource, this, the direct normal irradiance, direct, uh, direct radiation, and these are the this is the International Energy Agency, uh, agency uh, prospect that this technology, solar thermal electricity, will play an important role. In the, in the Middle East, in Africa, in India, in United, in United States, and in, uh, well, these are mainly the, the, the main regions. And I hope that also will continue playing an important role in Spain and in other places of, of Europe. These are the prospect of solar energy in general. I've been already discussed before, but uh, still the expectation is that the more you deploy in many countries, a PV, at some point, you start having to make curtailments because you cannot absorb, you have this, the, that curve and all these things, all these problems, and at some point, you need to start also replacing the, let's say, the, 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 uh, the, the reconfigure completely the energy system. And we, there are many studies have proved that uh, the introduction in the system of concentrated solar thermal technologies help increasing the uh, penetration of the other renewable technologies because of the thing. Okay. This is uh, an example also of a project combining both photovoltaic and, 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 uh, and, uh, and solar thermal capacities. And other thing that is also a, a message that the uh, International Energy Agency is emphasizing a lot, a lot is that heat process is more than a market niche for this technology. So that, and this is also that you will start seeing uh, in many, in many, in many countries. Now in Australia, there is also a push 
to increase the, the, the heat process application of this technology. I don't know, and also the agriculture. I don't know if you know that there is a, a company there sand, called Sandrop, a project. The company is called Sandrop. That is, a, I think, a European and Middle East company. And uh, they are growing a, a large fraction of all the tomatoes in Australia with a tower, solar tower system and a, in a, let's say, in an environment that they use uh, completely uh, all the, the energy to use for the production of the tomatoes is uh, renewable energies and mostly uh, concentrating solar thermal technologies in, in southern Australia. Another thing that is very interesting is more, let's, let's say, if toward the future, but still is an emerging technology, is the, the fuel and solar chemistry. And this is increasing the capabilities and, and the lot of activity in this sector because it's something that will have a lot of potential to decarbonize. Because uh, when we talk about climate change and we we'll talk uh, about the necessity of decarbonize the energy sector, it's not the electricity sector, it's the complete energy sector. We can, we have, oh, well, at the end is the complete economy. We have to stop delivering CO2 and other uh, greenhouse gases to the, to the atmosphere. And the only way to do it is to decarbonize the whole thing. One important aspect is the, 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 the transport system. And in order to decarbonize the transport system, you need to be able to use fuels that are not from fossil fuel origin. The challenges. Well, the challenges is that, and this is uh, uh, that the politician now in many countries, well, in some countries they are even negating that uh, we have climate change, that <laughs> we didn't need to do anything. But in most countries, they uh, are, uh, at least they have to, to, to do something. They have to pretend that they, have, they are under pressure to do something. And the temptation is to do the cheapest thing. But if you do too much of the cheapest things to, to don't think about what you're doing, or you're not planning enough, then the, the cheapest thing could not be the cheapest thing at some point. Okay? When you put a lot of photovoltaic in the system because it's the cheapest thing that you will get you on TV and you say, oh, we have deployed so much, so much, you start to deploy and you start to have problems with the stability of the grid, then you start with the curtailment. When you start, curtailment means that you tell the, comp the, 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 the industry or the, uh, the different installation not to produce uh, when, you, when they can produce. If you don't produce when you can produce, then the cost that you were saying that you were providing, the levelized cost of electricity, etc., changes. Because the expectation about how much you are producing, the number of hours that you were supposed to produce, you cannot deliver because the system cannot take it and all of these things. So this is a creating, uh, let's say, this is a, 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 a problem with this, that the, the typical, uh, let's say, uh, political reaction is we need to do something. We need to pretend that we like uh, solar energies and all renewable energy. We go to deploy the, the cheapest things, and then uh, we get in TV, et cetera, et cetera, and we are pretending that we are doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, you need to go a little further. You need to, pre to really uh, plan how you are going to decarbonize your energy system, what you will need a mix of, of technologies, not just one technology, and you need to start doing, the sooner you start doing the complete planification and knowing what you're doing and what you want to achieve, uh, the better. This is, uh, to me, is a problem that especially in Europe and in other places have, uh, when you have political processes that only have a, a scope of four years and your problems and your planning have to be much larger than four years, and this is a problem also how society is re responding to climate change, that is a long-term problem, it, you have to do something to adapt your political processes or the way you, you, you do things in order to, ta how to tackle this, uh, this long-term problem. And this is, a, this is, a, this is a, a challenge for, for many societies. This is what uh, I was referring to. You can uh, produce, uh, this is the, when you look at the, the demand net of uh, PV, this is the, the, what the people discuss, like the, that curve. And when you have a lot of PV and you don't have other, 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 uh, uh, other presses for mitigation, then if you have nuclear plants or you have a coal plants, etc., you have to, you cannot stop those plants. So you have to tell the PV, please don't, don't enter more, and then to do the curtain. You can plan solar PV, CSP, in a, in a different way so that, for instance, the solar PV, the, the solar, start producing the electricity at night or later in the, during the day because you store energy. And you can store energy much cheaper than with batteries and in a large scale right now already with the concentrated solar power technologies, like 10 times uh, cheaper when you transform in, in electricity terms. 
if I'm not mistaken. And uh, there is a plan in, uh, in Nevada that is a 250 megawatt uh, plan and has six hours of storage okay, at, at 250 megawatt. So, so the plant can deliver six hours after the sunset at the same uh, nominal capacity. The other thing that is also a problem with this is comparing, uh, we need to compare apples to apples. I'm not going to go too much because my point is that we don't need to compete with photovoltaics. What we need is to convince people that uh, we need everything renewable energy technologies and to get a good mix for every country that makes sense from the economic point of view, the economic development, the technology, etc., etc. Okay. But people, it's true that people are sometimes comparing, for instance, install, uh, a lot of people in the, let's say, I am from the, I am electrical engineer, the first thing that I did, I'm from my generation, people used to talk because they were not even renewable energy or something at the time, not, not too much talking about this, talk about install capacity. But you told install capacity and you, the cost per kilowatt. But the cost per kilowatt makes sense if your plant doesn't have a storage. At the end, what makes sense, because at the end, your, if you don't have a storage and you have, let's say, a, a plant that is working uh, 3,000 hours, and you're comparing all the plants that are working 3,000 hours, it doesn't matter to compare power or compare energy. What you really need to compare is the energy the cost of the energy that you are delivering during the, during the year. And this is something that still people are getting confused. Okay? So you see a lot of combination, oh, this is the, the cheapest per kilowatt. So what? <laughs> you need to tell me what is the energy that you produce and if this is, uh, it makes sense or not. And if you put a, a concentrated solar thermal pl uh, plant, uh, of course, if you put uh, a storage, it's more expensive per kilowatt because you have more hardware per kilowatt. But in terms of energy, is more is, is cheaper because you can store more more energy and you can and you can optimize the cost of the energy that you deliver. I this is the same thing. <laughs> so I'm going to also discuss something that is particularly interesting for these technologies. Is that well, uh, this the, the technologies were deployed commercially in uh, in the in the 80s by in the in California under a specific uh, regulation. They were called for some times. They were, they were uh, the Americans, they like a lot of things to do with economics and the, there was tax breaks to people that invest on these uh, technologies. They were called the, the plants of the dentist because the dentists have a lot of money and they were investing a lot on this uh, to get these tax breaks. So there was a company called Luz that is the uh, origin of American and Israeli origin. And they, were the, the, they, were, they managed to deploy 350 megawatts in relatively short, short period of time but uh, they went bankrupt. The reason they went bankrupt is they changed, the, the American, they changed the law, but also uh, one of the things that the provision of the, of the task break is that, uh, and also in America, I, I've seen also, that is a, when I was living in America for a long time, and uh, I, I witnessed the first bankrupt of a nuclear company. Because uh, in America, if you are deploying a, 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 you are deploying a technology, you don't start to get the benefits of the law and, unless, until you produce the first kilowatt. So if you have a limit or you have to a deadline and you don't produce within the deadline, you are dead. This is what happened to, to this company. They have to, to produce the electricity in the, when they started to develop the 80 megawatts, something that here, the 80 megawatt plants, because they, went, they started with 30 megawatt capacity and then they increased to 50 and then to 80. And uh, they, didn't, uh, they put a lot of pressure to try to finish on time. Pressure means uh, more, more resources, more money, they didn't finish on time and they went bankrupt. That didn't mean that the plant, the plant were finished. The, 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 low, the, the people who lend the money, the banks and especially the insurance company, I told you about the dentist <laughs> thing before, they uh, took the ownership of the, of the plants and they have been operating ever since. They have been operating for 30 years. This is also when you see some spots about alli alliance, we, ki we, we care for the ambient because well, they, 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 they inherited the, the plant. It was not in their plans initially to, to have this plant, but they, the, the company went bankrupt and they have to, to get the ownership of the plants. But one interesting, interesting aspect of this is that this plant has improved the performance over the years instead of decreasing the performance. Typically, when you put something, it, it, it gets old, et cetera, et cetera. They were able to increase the performance, of course, by maintenance, by replacing parts, et cetera, but also by improving the operation of the plant. They learn how to operate the plants over the year, and this is a very interesting study about the sex plant. You can see the total output 
was growing with the, with the year and the operational maintenance cost went down. Okay. This is something that typically is not what you are expecting, for instance, in photovoltaic plants. My understanding is at some point you start, uh, the, well, you have, you have some degradation, etc. Of course, I'm sure that if you replace everything that, uh, but this is a very, I think this is a very interesting, a very interesting experience. There is a, uh, and this is also true in Spain. In Spain, when I, I arrived to Spain, I was in the United States before, it was 2006, the feeding tariff uh, started to operate. We were, um, there were also plenty of money around, it was before the crisis, and we were a little worried that uh, a lot of people were entering into, into deploying these plants without having too much uh, uh, knowledge. So that's why I, my group, I put at the time, doing a lot of feasibility studies. I participated almost in all feasibility studies in, the, in Spain, but one. And, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very important that uh, you take into account all this, uh, all the uh, hiding costs and to also the other thing that is uh, also very important when you do all these this kind of things is the, the solar resource. A lot of people uh, were being very optimistic about the solar radiation, etc. So this is, I'm going to talk about this right now, the origin of the, uh, the city, the, the concentrated solar thermal industry in Spain. Well, all of them, of course, if you look at the map of radiation, I don't know if I have it here, we have more radiation in Spain in southern, <laughs> in the south than in the north. Still we have, this is the biomass plant, the one is near Barcelona. Let's say in near Barcelona, we are talking about one 1800, uh, uh, 1800 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter. And around Seville, this uh, here, uh, we have of the order of 2,100 kilowatt hours per square meter. This is the, the, the difference of, of the plant. You see that they, they try to go where, uh, where uh, the thing is. All of the plants are 50 megawatt. This is just by law, because the feeding tariff and the law for, for, um, for providing additional uh, feeding tariff to, they, they have a limit, the maximum that the size of the plant could be 50 megawatt. Okay. Otherwise, people who have gone to, to, fast, uh, to larger megawatt. There were, uh, let's say, was things with the feeding tariff, there have been many analyses before, and I also participated in a discussion in a, a book uh, about feeding tariffs within the World Bank. The, um, let's say, uh, perhaps were not the best structure in Spain, but what is clear is that it produced the, the starting of the market because you have a lot of other schemes that they look more interesting, more sophisticated, but that they don't give you the certainty for the investment to do the push, uh, the enough push to create the market. This uh, one thing that, uh, but so the, 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 the feeding tariff was very clear. The, the structure of the feeding tariff was a fixed feeding tariff that will decrease a little, but was established how much uh, decrease with time. And the, that was the good, the good part of the feeding tariff. A lot of people went because it makes a lot of economic sense. But the thing that was not promoting this kind of feeding tariff was the, the innovation. Because people, uh, all these projects have been done by project financing. Uh, another interesting thing is that typically, I was working in this field for 30 years because they, before there was no feeding tariff or nothing. And you have to hear from the electric utilities, the guy, oh, no one is interested in investing. No, no one is interested in losing money. But as soon as we have a law that allows people not to make 12% or 18% or like the electric utilities used to make in any project, but uh, just a 5% uh, a profit, a lot of people went for it. We have a lot of creation of new companies just to produce projects because they wanted to do the right thing. And people, but of course, one thing is to do the right thing and getting some money. Another thing is to do the right thing and losing money. So when you, but the, the difference is, is, is huge. So as long, the, the lesson, one of the lessons in Spain is that as, as soon as you have the, the legal framework that you are allows for people not to lose money, not just to get rich, not to lose money, a lot of people will go into renewable energy. That's at least what happened in the experience that we have in, uh, in Spain. The other thing is the, the thermal storage. Most of, we went, we have plants from six, well, for even from four to 15 hours of thermal storage. And uh, the, the initial plants, they, we were also built plants without thermal storage because, uh, well, for some uh, people make economic sense or something at the time, but that was a short-sighted uh, ambition. The other thing, as I said, the technology, that everybody went for parabolic trough. 
because when you go to the bank and the bank have to give you, let's say, 60% of the money, you said you can show that the plants in California have been working for 30 years. If you show any other technology, you don't have that, uh, that record. That's why uh, this is the other, the other about the benefits of these technologies is the, uh, the predictability. All, all of this, this is the production of all the plants in Spain during the month of July. So you see that, uh, that uh, you, you more or less you know what is going to happen the, the next day in terms of energy, of energy production. So it's, uh, this is also very good. The other thing that was uh, interesting, as I said before, is the development of the local industry. Of course, we have uh, companies putting absorber tubes there. Of course, the technology in this case was from Schott, from Germany, but the companies were, the, 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 the industry was, uh, was established in, in Spain. Collector structure, a lot of uh, companies went into, into metal uh, uh, processing and uh, mirrors, also, et cetera. So we have a very interesting, a macro, a very positive microeconomic impact because of the orientation of mature industry, the reinforcement of, the reinforcement of some industry sectors, and it also a huge impact in the auxiliary sectors, cleaning, road, transport, training, and all of these things for the deployment of these uh, of these plants. There have been a study that is I don't know if it's still available in the internet, but uh, when the Spanish government changed and the conservative government backed by the well, with a lot of friends in the electric sector, in the conventional electric sector when, and we have the economic crisis, they said, oh no, we cannot afford this. They, they were saying this at the same time that we were paying uh, nuclear. We have, a, we have a, a, a way to compensate, I think it's still in place in Spain, and they are trying to sell this, this in many other countries, in Chile it was before, and, was, uh, and it's, it's terrible because it's the marginal cost. And it means that uh, you are, every hour you are uh, uh, coupling the demand and the offer, and you pay everyone that, that offers the cost of the last one that enters. Okay. So you have a nuclear power plant. They have been already paid under the Franco regime in my country with the public money, given as a present by the utilities, again, pay to the utilities, etc., etc. So it's been amortized twice, and uh, this, can, they cannot stop, so they always offer at zero. So some people were saying in Spain, the nuclear is the cheapest because it's a zero. <laughs> you can even imagine how cheap it is. They just go into the market because they cannot, afford, they cannot stop the plants. Okay? So you go this, and we were paying nuclear that was completely amortized at the price of, of uh, wind. And this is what happened. This is a, by, the, by the own, their own technical people from the government, they were saying that the windfall profits of nuclear and, and big hydro was 500%. They still are. We were all the economic crisis with the 500% windfall profit with these uh, companies, and they have to stop the feeding tariffs in Spain because we cannot afford it. Okay. And if you look at this wind profit, we spend more, more money on this uh, uh, remunerating the, the nuclear, etc., than every, every money that we put in, in, in renewable energies. The, the, the Spanish, uh, because the people are not, uh, <laughs> they know what they're doing. The Spanish uh, technical people from the uh, Energy Commission, they advise the government to take the nuclear and the hydraulic out of this remuneration system and just give it some money. They did that with the, with the, with the solar plants. They, they, go, they did say to the solar plant, we cannot pay you the feeding tariff, we are going to remunerate only so that you have a profit of 12%. Instead of doing that, with the nuclear and the hydraulic. So that's just to give you an idea of what is uh, the, te the technical part and the technology. And the, and the. So we did, uh, well, not, not, not we, the, uh, Deloitte, this, uh, this, st this study about all of the feeding tariff money against all of the money that the state got through unemployment subsidies, saving of CO2 rights, saving for replacing importing fuels, uh, fiscal contribution of all the companies and contribution of all the economic sector to the gross domestic product, and it was clear that was an investment for Spain. Still, we stop it. And <laughs> I don't know. I think we are now going to change, but the government that we have there is going to. We don't know how much is going to last. The other thing is why the reason why Spain has been developing this uh, technology and was. Uh, because we have, and why other countries have been developing this technology. 
most of these countries, we have, uh, we started in the economic crisis, uh, uh, when you ha we have the economic crisis at the, at the end of the, of the 70s, because of the oil embargo and the OPED, et cetera, uh, uh, several, the International Energy Agency and several countries decided to go renewable energies, not to depend on the, on the, uh, on the fuel from, from the Middle East. And there was a project of the International Energy Agency that was located in Spain, was the SSPS project. And in parallel, at the same time, Spain was participating in the project. I was a student at the time and I participated in the evaluation of the project. And uh, at the same time, Spain decided to develop a project by itself in the near, nearby. This project was a demonstration project. The, the one of the International Energy Agency tried to prove which of the two technologies, parabolic trough of tower, was best. And they put together half megawatt parabolic trough plant and a half megawatt uh, tower plant together to see what was uh, best. And Spain decided to develop 1.2 megawatt uh, tower. After the demonstration, well, of course, we didn't, in the, I was in the international project. We demonstrated, we were the, the first project that uh, entered electricity, solar, concentrated solar thermal electricity in the grid in, in, in Europe. But uh, we didn't get any economic, <laughs> any, any real economic decision about what is best. Parabolic trough, of course, you cannot do it. And after the demonstration, both uh, uh, the, the, the price of oil went down and uh, a lot of people started not to be interested, going back as usual, business as usual. But uh, Germany and Spain decided that they would uh, continue. And this was the origin of these two projects. That was uh, 1979 to 1984. Uh, this was the starting of the, uh, of the Plataforma Solar Vermeria. Since then, Spain and Germany have been working together for a long time. 1996, uh, and, and together uh, having a director that was from Spain and a co-director that was from, from Germany. The German institution is the, they don't have, in Germany they don't have an energy institution. The, in Spain we do, we have CIMAT, that is the, the National Laboratory for Energy. We started uh, trying to develop the nuclear bomb, and then we moved towards <laughs> the more pacific things. And um, fortunately, at the time, the United States negotiated with us moving to, a <laughs> to, to other things. And, uh, and um, in, the, in Germany is the DLR, the German Aerospace Institute. So for a long time, CMAT and DLR have been working for almost 40 years now uh, at that, uh, there. Another thing that this technology is, uh, is a characteristic is because they require so much infrastructure. It's almost a, a conventional power plant. For a long time, these technologies, not only in Spain and in Germany, but in most countries, were only uh, in, the, in the national labs. So this is a technology that not too many universities have been, uh, uh, been able to, to, or not been involved traditionally, historically tradition. So if you look, this is uh, uh, where the technology started also in the United States, and the National Lab. They also have a, a large, uh, interesting, well, relatively uh, interesting plan there for also from the 80s. They also created a, a almost experimental plan, Solar 1 and Solar 2. That was the origin of the uh, molten salt technology. Well, you have to say that the Spanish plan there, they already have molten salt in 1983. So this not uh, have been discovered. <laughs> the thing is that our, our receiver, the receiver was a, a steam receiver, but the, the storage was in molten salt. In the, in the international plan, the receiver was a sodium receiver, and the storage was also sodium. So Sandia National Lab also have been working for a long time. And if you look in, the, in, in Israel, the, the Weizmann Institute was also involved. It's a, almost a national lab. And these are the, the countries that have been more or less during all these uh, up and downs working on, the, on this area. And these are the ones that, that have been more developed. Now there are a lot of emerging, this is a little obsolete, this is uh, emerging countries. And uh, one thing that uh, I think that even if it's obsolete, one thing that is interesting is I talked I talk before about the feeding tariff. Feeding tariff was very good because of the, of the clarity and the, the, well, and the, let's say, and the, um, uh, legal, uh, the legal framework that was very, very solid. And the problem with it was that Spain uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't abide by the legal framework. It was uh, as being a big cost for the, for the country because, you know, when you put laws and you don't follow your own laws, it's not, uh, it's not good for the credibility and for future investment. And we still have a lot of, uh, I think a lot of plans are still in the international courts. But, uh, 
but uh, in, uh, in South Africa they did a very good uh, way to do some kind of, uh, of uh, competitive uh, tariff so that they reduce the cost by some kind of uh, economic competition. That was, I think that was uh, very, very interesting. And so there are, uh, let's say, there are a lot of lessons that you can learn about the world, how to structure this in a way that you can uh, foster the technology in the country, at the same time put pressure on lowering the, the cost. Not only lo lowering the cost is important, it's also important to foster innovation, and this is a more tricky thing, because uh, innovation is uh, associated goal with good risk, and uh, investment is associated with banks and with uh, not, not going for risk. So somebody has to pay for the additional risk in order to, uh, to compensate innovation. I think that very recently, I am also the vice chair of Solar Paces, in the, and uh, very recently we have published a very interesting article uh, with a person from Massen explaining what is the, the structure that the Morocco has created to, to deploy this technology. It makes a lot of, a lot of sense and how they have make it a, a, a lot of, uh, well, one way to, to absorb this, this risk within the, within the system. Well, just to say this is uh, emerging markets is not emerging anymore. And uh, Chile is very interesting because the markets are completely, um, Chile is, uh, de is developing the technology because just as a purely uh, market driving uh, thing, because it makes a lot of sense because of um, the amount of radiation that they have in the desert and also the, all the mining industry, etc. South Africa, I don't know, has been doing, uh, I don't know what is the situation now, but the, this thing that they were doing with the rounds about lowering the fiscal was very good. And the Chinese, uh, they are completely clear. They have been for a long time, they are spanning, at least my understanding uh, has been until, I don't know if that has changed in the last two years, but they were spanning five years uh, research uh, programs every year. <laughs> so they are really interested in the technology and they have also starting to put some kind of feeding tariff to, the, uh, to deploy this, uh, this technology. So that's, um, that's that. <laughs> you have uh, questions? I don't know if I'm, we are in time or? Yeah. So. Um, no. <laughs> Well, uh, depends on the technology. The one that scale um, very well is parabolic trough. Parabolic trough are uh, scale better than, than, than tower because the tower you start getting very far, but parabolic trough is modular and, uh, 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 and this scale very well. And, and you have, as I said, you have plants in California. It's a 250 megawatt plant, only one plant with a, that is, I think, is a kind of a one square kilometer or, or several, well, I don't, I don't know exactly, I don't remember, but, uh, or three kilometers square, something like that. So that, uh, that uh, a tower technology, I think that, uh, to me, the, 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 if you start getting too large, you have to, to the tower have to be too high, very high, and, uh, and I think that, I will say that the, the limit of a tower plan for one tower the thing is you can put several towers and then try to... Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. can't scale and have several... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, they, are, they, are, they are already in, uh, in Australia, for instance, uh, one, of the, well, one of the few commercial companies that were developing there were developing a modular structure like eSolar that they have a small towers with the, that, uh, with the uh, let's say, uh, the, the answer is I really don't know what is best. I know I always, I've been an electrical engineer, but I always been not completely happy with the large plants. Even the, I know that the, you get the scale, but the thing is, sometimes, as I said before, in the economic term, when you look, you have, different, uh, you, you have different views of reality depending on what is your role. If your role of your, your, your business is to sell electricity and decrease the cost, etc., maybe putting everything in one place could make sense because... Uh, but maybe not, because, for instance, uh, one problem, if you look at the nuclear power plants, 
The people say in Spain that, uh, that in Spain, no, uh, you can build tomorrow a, power, a nuclear power plant. It's not forbidden. Nothing, no one forbids you to build a power plant. What forbids you is the economic. No one is getting the, <laughs> the funding to build the power plant. They want, they say that they are cheaper, etc. but they want, for instance, the government to reduce the, uh, the risk, to absorb the risk of something happening with the plant. But the problem of the plant is an important cost is the insurance cost. Is, uh, you have a nuclear accident, can affect 300,000 people who pay that cost of the insurance. And they, what they want is the subsidy of the government putting laws that limit the, the, the risk of the plant. But, uh, but my point is that uh, when you build very, very big plants, you have a big impact on the, on the environment. This has already been attested with nuclear plants, etc. Because uh, all of these plants, the, uh, these uh, thermal machines, you have to, to drop to the ambient a very, a, 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 let's say, one third or two thirds, let's say, of the, of the heat. At the, and then if you are using a river, you are hitting the river below, the, so in many cases, below the condition for the people, the, the, the fish to live there, and you have to, to have a disruption on the, on the ambient. So having very large plants, as a disruption in the vicinity of the very large whatever you have. This is one thing. Other thing, now we live in, a, in my view, we live in a world that is less predictable than in the past. In the past, we were, and my, most of my life have been in the, well, most of my life, being, part of my life, one third, have been in an under dictatorship, <laughs> and, and most of the time in between the, the Cold War. You have uh, two bands and more or less the plan structure. Now you have a lot of terrorist activity. If you have a few plants in a country, you have a much more uh, chances of somebody thinking about shutting down your country. No one shuts down the internet because it's very much deployed. So having a small plants may have an inherent uh, uh, security thing from the point of view of, the, uh, of security, of, of national security. So I am not, uh, also from the point of view of uh, the other thing, you have a big plan, you have to put it some far away, then you have all the transmission losses. Of course, if you are just not paying the transmission losses, somebody else is. The thing is, there are many, <laughs> I'm not sure that the, the, the big plants, even when you do it at the global scale, makes completely sense now. So, and I think that the replicating in renewable energy what the, the, the world that we have, a conventional energy, I don't think is the way to go. That's my personal, my personal opinion. I will go better for a smaller system, scattered all, all around, including well, of course, the, the problem with concentrating solar thermal and the problem with the, the conventional plants is that you, the, the steam turbine doesn't scale well down because uh, it costs the same amount of operation and maintenance to maintain a 50 megawatt turbine than a 200 megawatt turbine, more or less, or a 500. Okay. So then, then uh, but uh, one of the things that I think is very important, and I didn't say the value proposition of this technology, any advance in, in turbines or in the conventional thing, is also an advance on this technology. One interesting thing for, for, for me is that now a lot of people, and when I was in Australia, we were working on supercritical CO2 cycles. If we manage to, and I think uh, all, a lot of industry, that will scale down very well in terms of efficiency and in terms of cost and maintenance. The same thing with the gas turbines, etc. So depending on the technology, you may want to have a smaller plants scattered and Another uh, question with the, uh, this is uh, similar, is uh, the automotive industry. You can get a cheaper price by the, by the car, by selling a lot of small cars, or by selling, or by selling very big cars. So, that's, so I think the, the, to me it's not clear, let's say the situation is not clear, and there are uh, a lot of arguments in, 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 in every direction. Also, when you have a very big project, this is another problem with this technology, it, it, costs, it make, makes more economic sense, but it takes much more time to get the, financing, the financial closing. So maybe better to get smaller projects, you deploy things faster, you learn, you decrease the cost, etc. This is what's happening with photovoltaic. You can deploy the photovoltaic, and this is one of the advantages of the, of the technology. Sorry, you have a question. Mm -hmm. 
Well, there. Well, there have been uh, studies about uh, what, uh, uh, what land you require for many, even for nuclear, because uh, some of these conventional plants, they, they are hiding requirements about the thing. For nuclear, they require a lot of land to get the, the uranium <laughs> somewhere else in another country, and, and you destroy for every, I think, one kilogram of uranium is like, I don't know how many tons of, of land that you have to move, etc. With the same with coal, etc. So the, and the, if you look at the, for instance, a big hydraulic, the, the density per, per, per square meter is much is one one tenth of a, a solar plant. So you, you want, uh, so you want to use a hydraulic plant, you you need to float some place. The typically when you get the power of the plant, let's say the the, the most relevant one was in in Brazil. When you get the the surface area that you put under the water in order to get the the power of the plant. Uh, when you divide the, the power by the surface, it's much lower than the density per surface far than this uh, technology. But it's, it's, it's true, it's a, it's a cost, and if it has to be in the, in the cost of the system. If the land is very costly, you will may, not, it not may, may not make economic sense. Well, the, the thing is, uh, I think there are some papers, some comparisons. Uh, there was some comparison between uh, the one that I know is not so much of this. Uh, you have some, com you know some? Com I, I have seen there is a report from, I don't know if it's IEA or I can look for it. They explicitly compare the cost of the collected energy, which is not really fair actually because yeah. Lighter. So at the end of the plant, you maybe it's likely that you can dismantle the plant and use the land again. But if you build a nuclear plant or a, a coal plant, that, that land is going to be is going to cannot be used for ages. Like it, it takes uh, a lot amount of money and uh, effort to re time to reconvert it to a usable land. There are important experiences in uh, in Germany, the Ruhr uh, region, but it took like a We do, we do have, um, yeah. we do have, we do have some comparison in Spain. You, we have a, a company called Red Electrica that is the grid operator. You have, a, in real time, you have all the information about what is the production of everything in Spain, in real time. And uh, there are reports, and uh, for instance, uh, the CSP has one third of power capacity than the photovoltaic installed in Spain, and the energy that we produce is half. This gives you an idea. So the, the photovoltaic is, uh, is three times more power, nominal power installed, and the energy produced during the year is only, uh, the, the, is, is only half. So uh, basically what I'm looking for here on, on, on the second question earlier is land-wise, like if- Well, it depends, yeah, yeah, I know. I will go back to you on this during the week. I don't know, I don't have the answer right now. Depends a lot on the technology also because uh, the photovoltaic, most of the plants are uh, still fixed uh, panels. 
So you don't, well, also the, the one that we're not talking, photovoltaic are supposed to get also the, um, the diffuse radiation, so it's a, it's a, a sort of fraction, but also a photovoltaic panel, I think the performance is of the order of 12%, uh, percent, no? something like that, 10 to 12%, percent, while uh, this, uh, this technology is of the order of 20. So you need to, yeah, you need to do, a <laughs> develop one plan and another and see how, I think I am sure that there are some papers about this. I, I will get back to you during the during the week. 